Uh, it's great to be here. First of all, thank you, Andy, for this for the wonderful you know, intro, but also this opportunity to kind of talk to you guys. Awesome event, and I, I think the the level of conversation that we've had over the past three days has been phenomenal. So congratulations to you. So, like Andy said, my name is Raghav Goyal. I lead growth for design and video here at Adobe. Um, what I'm going to do today is kind of talk about some of the learnings that I've had over the years and my journey into growth and what I've learned along the way. I'm going to use XE, like um, Andy said, to kind of make those examples a little bit more concrete, but uh, this is a little bit more fun, so. First of all, uh, I have this presentation kind of as a PDF at this particular location, so if you guys need it, you can just go get that at that point. So. Uh, and Andy, you're probably going to be sending this out as well, but still, you guys need that. Cool, so starting with, uh, my journey has been a little kind of long-winded. Uh, started off as a robotics engineer, actually, that's what I wanted to do, build robots for a living. Uh, I wanted to get my master's in robotics, and I figured out that I didn't have any money. So I said, you know what, I'm going to take a couple of years off, uh, you know, work somewhere, make some money, and then go do my master's. And that's how I ended up joining this small company called Micromedia um, as a software engineer uh, for the Flash platform working on Flex. Anybody heard about Flex? Oh, wow, a bunch of people here. That's awesome. Anyway, so those two years turned out to be five, and I ended up not really enjoying the coding part of it, but loved the product. So I moved in from an engineering background into being a, what Adobe calls a product evangelist. Uh, talking to customers, understanding their pain points, helping them kind of figure out these different things about the product. Um, and then at some point in time, I was like, hey, this is all great, but you know, the users are telling me a lot of things, and I really want to change the product to kind of fit what they're kind of telling me. Uh, and somebody, somebody told me, that's product management, that's what they do. I was like, okay, how do I do that? Um, and somebody said, you need a master's degree, you need an MBA or a business degree, so I went and did that. And then finally ended up at Adobe, back at Adobe as a product manager. Um, took a little bit of detour, um, selling or marketing soaps and sanitizers for an industrial chemicals <laughs> company out of Minnesota. That was, that was fun. Um, anyway, uh, but my real kind of journey into growth started when I was uh, a PM for onboarding for XD. So. I started with, uh, I went to my boss and said, hey, I really don't have any data about our users. I don't really know what they're doing. You're asking me to design this onboarding, but what's, what's happening here, right? Uh, so he basically turned back and said, here's two recs, go hire a team and figure it out. I had no idea how to do analytics, but I did. I went and hired a data scientist, a data engineer, built out a whole growth team, one of the first product analytics teams here in Adobe. Um, and in due course of that, we learned a lot of things that's helped me at Growth Team today. Right? So basic things like cohort analysis and funnel analysis and uh, statistics for A-B testing and all that kind of stuff. So that was, that was great. And the other thing that was happening at that time, and I think you, 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 know, you talked about this, Chris, a little bit. Onboarding is not just about the product. If you want to think about it holistically from email and, and notifications and all these different pieces. Um, and I was told, well, that's marketing's job. It's not product. Okay, but I, I, I want to connect these things. I, there wasn't really anything going on at that time. So I kind of got together a bunch of marketing people, a bunch of uh, designers, a bunch of engineers, and started a small team, which I then realized is what's called growth. So great, okay, so how do I get into that? Uh, and that's when I met like Brian Balfour and uh, did the Reforge program. And if anybody here is really considering getting into growth and starting a growth team, I highly recommend that program. I think it was one of the best things I did as a professional development piece. And then, you know, I'm, I'm at my current role. Of, so, this is kind of just my journey, but let's get into what the talk's actually about. So, here's some of the learnings that I've had along the way, right? Here's the first one. Product teams focus on the ideal user. I, I learned this really early in my evangelism days, right? I would go talk to users, take their feedback, send that to the teams, some of the feedback was getting heard, something else wasn't. I was like, well, why is some things working and something not? And what I realized is the product teams are creating for that ideal user. Somebody who just looks at the product and the feature and they get it. Like, this is awesome. This, is, this will solve my problem. The growth team, I think Bagali Kaba kind of talked about this a little bit on the first day at, at uh, Instacart. Um, 
should focus on that user who's not that ideal user. They're, they're still the, the actual target user for you, right? But they're not the ideal user. And so that's really important for a growth team. So this is my, one of the things we did, not really knowing the about one at a time, was I think, again, Chris, you talked, you will see this, that things that I'm going to talk about here, there will be threads through up the four days, so I didn't plan it, but it kind of happened that way. We did was, when we started off, we got the whole team to just talk to users. And talking not just any users, users kind of fall into multiple buckets, right? So you get those new users, you get them to talk to those new users who started with the product and stayed. They were like, oh, this is great, I'm, you know, this is, this is awesome. Or people who actually try, tried it and did not. What this does is it gives you a lot of in perspective into why people are staying and not the, the, and people who are not, right? And that can feed into a lot of the hypotheses that you would then test. On XD, we heard a bunch of things. On one side, people said, I love XD. I will come back when I have a need. So that just means that people were coming to the product who didn't really have a recurring need sometimes, right? On the other hand, we had people who were saying, I love XD, but the reason I can't really adopt it is my team is standardizing on a different tool. They're used to a certain process, and I can't really just adopt the tool myself. I need my developers, I need my stakeholders, all these people to be on this tool. So onboarding is not just about that one user. Now you're starting to think more broad than that. That kind of brings me to the second one. Uh, know your users moments of delight and frustration. But I, and this is my, my intern a couple of years back named it aha moments and bug moments. And I'm pretty sure you've heard of aha moments, but probably not the other one. What these are are just moments of delight and moments of frustration that your user has as they're starting with the tool or, or product or app or whatever that is, right? And that is critical. So what we did with and this is user testing, where's uh, heaps over there? Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so what we did was we basically got some new users who had never used XD. We asked them to use it, we recorded them. We were like looking for those moments of delight. And the simple answer is you can hear it. Your elbow plays. I'm hoping the sound will come through. There's our Oh, there we go. Ooh, that's nice. Just a little bit of a drop. I don't know I'm right in there. That's really, I like that it just instantly knows that you're dropping it into that area. That's what Usually if I try to go on Photoshop, I have to like, I've got that little circle, and you have to stick, and then drag it over into my design, and it's a real little bit of a you can drop that in there, and then you should be more. It's fantastic. That's oh, fantastic, so, so, all, right? so right. helpful. That person's really excited that, that that thing worked for them. Here's another one. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I really like that. That's really cool. Can we pull it through? And then you just the pen. Oh, that's cool. I like that a lot. That is very nice. Wow. Okay. And, and my favorite part of that clip is the last okay. It's like she's saying, this is awesome. I need to see more. Like, that's what you're listening for. You're listening for those aha moments, those moments of delight that the user has. And your onboarding needs to basically enhance that. Right? Now, and there's certain things that people say, it might not only be this is awesome, but they could also say, I'm loving this, oh, that's what it does, oh, that's great, right? Things like that. But here's the other side of it. Here's moments of frustration. Again, you can hear it very well. And here's a couple of examples. Um, I'll actually play the first and the second one. Um, and then, um, one, two, three, four, five, very nice. I'm loving this. And then... Oh, but it copies. That's so much talking to me. If you guys didn't hear it, she said annoying, annoying, annoying. She was like, this sucks. <laughs> and, and, the, and the most interesting part of that one is she was very excited by that, that feature, right? She started off, she's like, I'm loving this. And then she's like, oh, what just happened, right? Here's another one, which is kind of like that. It was, wasn't what she expected. And then, oh, 
at the beginning, there's options to choose sizes. Here, it does not allow me to do that. And also, looks like here it has multiple particles. Here, Anyway, so these hub moments, oh, and I'm not really sure which one's the clicker, I'm going to try one to see. Uh, these hub moments can be a lot more subtle, right? You're, you're not just looking, you're always looking for the, oh, this is crazy and this is not working for me, but you're also looking for things like, what just happened? It, it basically sends a signal that the user was expecting something and your app did something completely different, right? That could mean delight because you, they're, they're seeing something that is not what they expected and that's awesome. Or this could be like, oh, why did it do that? It's not really sure. And my my the, the, the thing that actually give dread that I dread the most is the last one there, which said, I think I did something wrong. And I hear this all the time, the user kind of saying, Oh, I am stupid. I, I think th this is not how this should be. That's a red flag right there. That just means that you made your user feel stupid. That's the worst thing you can do, right? So these are the things that you need to focus on for onboarding. E are those kind of Moments, well, not aha uh -huh moments, not. I have the right one. Great. The reason it's important is this. I think Darius Contractor, well, he was at Facebook, uh, at, uh, sorry, uh, Dropbox, uh, he created this framework that he calls the site framework. Right? I, I really like this because it, it captures this whole aha uh -huh moment, up moment piece really well. What he says is when a user starts a, tool, a, a new tool, a new app, whatever that is, right, they start with a certain level of sight. They're psyched about it. Either it's because they have a huge problem and, you, and, they, and somebody told them that this product actually solves it, so they're really excited to try it out. Or your marketing has been really effective and sold them on this awesome vision of what you can do with this, and they come into your product, right? Every single aha moment the user hits, that site is going to climb, right? And, and, and you heard that in that first video. Okay, let's go, right? The, the user is actually psyching themselves up, and that's great for you. On the other hand, every odd moment would start to kind of taper that, that site down. And there's a threshold, and it's usually different for different people, but at some point the person's going to be like, this is not worth it. I'm out of here. Right? And this is why a lot of mobile apps, you get one launch, like one or two launches. If the user's not able to get to, like you had a couple of your pieces there, if you're not able to get to those actions in the first two launches, they're out. They're probably never coming back. Right? So this is a big framework that I, that I like. Cool. This is the next learning that I have. Data tells you the what, users tell you the why. Um, very obvious based on all what we've been hearing. The reason I put it here is what I see most teams do is they over-index on one or the other. Let me explain what I mean by that, right? So some teams, what they do is they over-index on data. So they look at data, say you're an e-commerce company and you're like, oh, we have issues with cart emissions. We only have 10% of our users adding stuff to the cart. They directly go to, let's design an experiment to figure out how we can increase carts. And some people might say, oh, that's probably because the icon is too small. Or some people might say, oh, that's because let's have a coach mark that tells them that the cart is right here, right? Um, but they don't understand the why. Like, why is somebody not adding? Maybe it's none of that. Maybe the selection on your site sucks. And that's why they're not adding stuff to the cart. So the, the best case scenario, you're going to run tests that are not going to work. Right? The worst case scenario, you're actually going to run tests that's going to hurt your, your bottom line. Right? So you need to really understand the why. Now, on the other hand, if you're just talking to a bunch of users and then saying, oh, I think I know what the problem is, let's go run a test. You might choose a wrong part of the funnel. So if you have a funnel like this one, and you're running a test right here between the green and the blue, well, you might get a 20% bump, but it's not going to make a big impact. Well, if you do the same thing on the orange and the blue, that's actually a lot more impactful for your metric, right? So you want to make sure you're bringing these two things together. Cool. This is the next one. Um, so as you're thinking about tests, and, and, and this might be a little controversial based on some of the other talks that we've had. Like, you know, so we've, we've seen this one, right? We said, okay, let's say we see that X percent of our new users are dropping off after the first session. That's the data problem that we saw. And here's a hypothesis. If we help a new user with a real project, then I think we can trigger purposeful exploration and we can improve our activation rate. And, uh, you know, if I remember from a couple of talks from the other days, people said, that's what a hypothesis should be. There should be an if, then, and and. 
right? If we do this, then this would happen, and that would lead to this metric. Well, I would say, actually not I, uh, there's this very smart people sitting back there in our user research team who's going to school me on this one. Um, and they say, that's not a hypothesis, that's a prediction. You're predicting that if you do this, then this will happen. The hypothesis is really the underlying reason why you think that would work. So in this case, the hypothesis could be something like this, right? We believe that a lot of users don't have a project in mind. They end up playing aimlessly in the tool, and then they, they never come back. So it's really, and it's kind of going back to that underlying why question, and, and then the data, and the, and the user part of it. This is really important. You might say, hey, this is actually just semantics. You're calling it hypothesis. I'm calling it a user problem. What's the big deal? The big deal is this, that same data point that we saw that you're going to go run a test on, you could have multiple hypotheses that could cause that same thing, right? For example, in addition to that, we could say, oh, users are not ready to engage when the product comes up. That's probably why, right? Uh, and they just go away, and they forget about it. Or we could say, oh, it's, it isn't clear to the user what this thing is. They come to it, they're like, oh, this is probably not what I'm here for. They go away. And if you think that doesn't make sense, let me take an example. How many of you guys have had, heard of uh, Headspace? Yeah. Right, a lot of people. So for the people who have it, it's a meditation app. Now, they have a problem, and I, I don't know if you guys will have the same problem as well, is the time when a new user installs Headspace, they're probably not ready for their meditation. Right? They, they heard it at work, and they installed it because their buddy told them to, or something like that, right? They're not ready for meditation, so it's really possible that you're going to forget about the fact that you even have this app and never really try out Headspace, and Headspace doesn't even get a chance to activate you. So what do they do? As part of their onboarding flow, which starts like here, they ask you this question, which says, when do you want to meditate? And I'm like, oh, I want to do that after I get home. What time? Right? What time do you want to meditate? Let so you, you do two things here. One, you are getting the user to basically tell you that, hey, I, I really have intention, right? I would like to do it here. If once you write down something, you're much more likely to do it. That's just psychology, right? So you're, you're getting them to do that, right? You know what this, the, the other thing? I mean, Chris talked about this, getting people to accept notifications. You will get a reminder at 6 p.m. You're much more, if you show your notification accepting screen right after this one, you're much more likely to accept that notification because now you've set it up for 6 p.m. and you want to hear from the app that, I, mean, I want to meditate, I'm excited, but it's the psych part, right? I'm excited to meditate, I'm putting time down for it, now I'm much more likely to accept your notifications at that point in time, right? So that's why this is important. It's, I mean, if you have the right hypothesis, you can design the right test and you will have the impact that you're looking for. Okay. I have two more. This is the, the next one, which is, it's all about user psychology, kind of going back to what I was saying earlier. Um, and my favorite kind of way to think about this is what the Reforge framework calls the L word framework. But it, the, 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 the thing there is, everybody makes decisions in an emotional fashion. It doesn't matter if you think you're the most rational person in the world, emotion drives your decisions. The logic is basically trying to convince you that the emotion that you just had is the right one. Right? You're rationalizing your decisions that the emotion has kind of told you, right? So from a, what this means for growth and just experiment design and things like that, our role is one of these two things. Like, what is the motivation that we need to provide to that user to complete that? And what is the reward that they get, right? Now, each decision that the user has to take is kind of like a hill, right? Uh, and I'll take, and I was going to take a different example now that Chris has talked about Strava, I'm going to say, some, uh, say something about that. I tried Strava, I, actually, my, I did and my boss did, uh, we both tried Strava around the same time, and this was like a couple years back. I got so spooked that I ran from there, and I was like, I did not go back to Strava after that, because when I opened it, it was all athletes, and you can look at me, I'm not an athlete. Right? I'm looking at this going, oh, this looks like it's for like super athletic professional people. I don't think, think this is for me. I think I'm going to go to my fitness pal or something like that. <laughs> my, my boss, on the other hand, he's an avid biker, runner. He looked at it and went, finally, somebody's actually making an app for me. Right? 
he, he hated the My Fitness Pal and the Runner, I forget the other couple of things that are in Runtastic and all that kind of stuff. He looked at Strava and he's like, this is exactly what I was looking for. So, you have your type of users down here. My emotion is fleek. I'm running, right? I'm running away from the app. But I'm probably using it to run. Right? So the, motiva the motivation that Chris's team needs to provide me is very different than my, from my boss. My boss probably they don't need to motivate him at all to do take his first you know uh, hike or his first ride. Right? And the reward again, I don't think you have to reward him at all because his reward is that first stats. When he sees that first stats, he's, and he gets that first kudos, that's his reward. It's a very you know, I would say, you know, I think a reward, uh, a first stats is kind of very intrinsic for what you're kind of really excited about what you've done. You probably have to do something more for me. You have to really convince me that this is the right thing for me, right? So really understanding who your users are, what kind of emotions they have as they're starting your app, and segmenting almost to figure that out will help you be more successful. And that's why I say it's all about user psychology. Here's the last one. Learning is the goal, impact is the outcome. And I say this because almost all grow teams, I mean, grow teams are probably more data oriented than most other teams. You have a KPI that you're trying to hit, whether it's signups, whether it's um, you know, uh, conversion, whether it's activation, you have some goals to hit, right? Now, the problem I've seen is people just trying to run multiple experiments, trying to get to that outcome. But if you're not learning from your mistakes, you're not pausing to say, why did not that test work? You're in trouble. Okay, I'll give you, I'll give you an example of something my team did well, and there are a lot of examples where we didn't do well, and I didn't want to share that. But here's an example. And I see Victoria there smiling as I show this. Um, so we have this hypothesis that there's a lot of people using Photoshop for UX design. And Photoshop is not really the best tool for UX design, right? But a lot of people are using Photoshop because that's what they're used to. But if you could add Photoshop and XD together, that just changes your workflow, lets you do a lot, a lot more, lets you do things a lot faster, right? And we had research, we talked to users, all that things that they kind of showed, kind of told us that that was true. So we said, okay, you know what? Let's do this. Let's go talk to the Photoshop user who's most likely to be a UX designer, and let's give him or her an, uh, an in-app notification, the stuff that Andy was talking about that uh, I supposedly did really well on XD. Let's do that in Photoshop and tell that user about how you can use Photoshop and XD together. And we had uh, one of our evangelists who was a Photoshop person kind of talk about what, what it is, and uh, we kind of put that out there, and there's multiple people who are here in the audience who helped me put this out there. Well, this is what happened. We put this out there, I think, two days before Thanksgiving, and on Thanksgiving Day, I get calls from like multiple of my teammates. He's like, have you seen Twitter? This is kind of blown up. I'm like, what happened? This is what happened. People are saying, if you can't read it from back there, this ad popped up while I was working in Photoshop. Adobe, why do you think this is acceptable? It, my heart sank, because that's not what it was. It was supposed to help you to be better, but it did not come out that way. I mean, the team was awesome. They, they jumped on it. They switched off the test. And you can see it here. It says 525 likes and 85 retweets. That's not good. Right? <laughs> we, had a, we, had a, we had a bad PR situation on our hands for this one. And then, you know, people started saying things. People were, internally, they were like, that copy was not good. Or that animated GIF that you had was a bad idea. Or who thought this was okay? Did you even test this with users? And the answer is yes, we did test it with a bunch of users before we put it out there, right? So we got all these feedback from our from our company, and we could have said, "Oh, sorry," but then just moved on to the next experiment. Credit to the team. The team said, "We want to know why that didn't work." We actually had a lot of evidence that this message was good, but what happened, right? So they said, "Okay, you know what? Let's go talk to that person. Let's go talk to the person, ask him why." he had that reaction. Because for every person who has that reaction, there's probably like 200 of them who had the same reaction but did not tweet, right? And the answer we got was this. I didn't even read what you guys were telling me. Why, why was that? Oh, um, I didn't like the fact that you were trying to push another app on me while I'm in Photoshop. Because I was working, I was completing my project and this thing came up. I, I, just, I, I just got pissed off. I didn't even think about what that thing was saying. 
like, okay, I'm sorry, sorry that you had to go through this, blah, blah, blah. And then we were like, okay, can you can you take five minutes to go through the content with us and tell you if this is even interesting? He got super excited, actually, once we went through it. He was like, oh, actually, that's great. I mean, you know, I, I would sure love to try XP and then I'll, I'll let you know. He actually even sent me an email later saying, oh, I tried out XP, this is pretty interesting. I didn't know we could do this. So, and this, this is the framework that Victoria, who's back there, who's our user researcher on this one, actually um, helped us figure out later, not when we were doing this, but later, that any test when it fails, don't move on. Figure out what's the problem, right? Figure out if it's a problem with your understanding of what the user problem was. Because maybe your user problem understanding is solid. And what the problem is, is actually in the intervention that you did. Right? Or maybe you thought this was the user problem and you actually figured out that actually it's not, it's something completely different and that's why the thing didn't work. Right? In this case, the team said, yeah, I, I do think that we have a high confidence in the user problem and I think we just you know, did not do a good job with the intervention. They ended up retesting the same test with a little better copy, I would say, uh, but on our Creative Cloud desktop application. And that's the place where people go to install applications. That's the place where people go to see their notifications. So it wasn't interrupting their flow. They were going there to look at apps and notifications. So this fit right in. This is one of our best resurrection tests that we've ever done. Right? So that's one of, I think that's the, the learning that I kind of go back to the teams when something doesn't work. Let's figure out why. That's super important. So, cool, you said you were going to talk about SD and you didn't really talk about SD as much. What, what's got to, this got to do with SD onboarding, right? So, with SD, this is what we did. Is, uh, this was our, our, our uh, predictions on SD based on some of the hypotheses that we had about the user's problems. We, said, we thought that users were coming to SD didn't really know what it was or had a, a certain idea, but it wasn't really chatting. So we're like, let's put a video that replaces the existing. So this, by the way, this was the existing um, start screen when when I took over uh, as as PM for XD onboarding, uh, and there was a there was a tutorial that was there which was talking a lot about features. It was like here's how you mask, here's how you do this, here's how you use the repeat grid. Um, so our first three things that we did. The first thing that we did was we ran an intro video. So when you open up XD for the first time, there's no audio, it's just a silent video that plays, which kind of shows you what XD is all about. That idea did not work, because it was, again, interrupting the users wanting to try it. The user was psyched, they wanted to try out XD and play a video. I think the mean or median watch time for a 10, 20 second video was like two seconds. So people just clicked on it and just moved on. They did not even pay attention to it. This was the next one. So we said, if we help new users start with a tutorial, then we'll get better results because the people who are using tutorials, they were retaining much better than if they just started with a new file. And we had some feedback that our, our tutorial wasn't really very visible in the old cases, so we actually moved to this, what we call a bifurcated welcome screen, which we have till date. So if you're a new user, your welcome screen looks kind of like the one up top, where the focus is on that tutorial. While once you start with files and start to kind of do more with XD, that goes, it doesn't go away, it's still available down here, but the focus is your content. Like either you can start a new file or you can go to your recent files. In fact, those recent files have become even more prominent in the latest design if you go and look at it, uh, that it has evolved. And this has actually increased, uh, I don't exactly remember the exact percentage, but it, it increased by like 30 or 40 percent the take rate of the tutorial. Um, and, and we got a really nice bump in our return usage rate, at least in the early return usage rate for XD. This was the third thing that we did. It was uh, we reoriented the tutorial to focus on these aha and not moments. Um, didn't really work. We were trying to figure out why. Um, turns out that the, A, the whole concept of a tutorial doesn't really jive well with a lot of people, so we actually, in the latest iterations, um, have rebranded re it to starter files, which a lot of people seem to like better than tutorials, because if you're, if you're a sketch user or a Photoshop user, like, well, I need a tutorial, I already know how to do design, right? So we kind of, kind of call them starter files, where you explore the tool rather than a tutorial. We're not trying to teach you, we're trying to help you explore. 
right? Um, and the other one that, that really did, uh, that, that was there was the content that was in the tutorial had to be bifurcated, not bifurcated, but split for like different user types, which is something that we we're doing right now. So that brings me to, here are the six things that I've learned, and hopefully you guys learned something today. Uh, I'm constantly learning, and that's my motto for you guys, just keep learning. I mean, if you keep learning and, and reinvesting those learnings back into your experimentation, you'll be okay, you'll do a great job of growth. Thank you. Okay.